Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Liam Solis from KTH Roll Institute in Stockholm. Cool. Thank you very much uh, for everyone for coming and uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing such a great workshop. It's been some really fantastic talks so far. And, uh, really looking forward to the rest of the week. So, um, yeah, today I would like to tell you a little bit about some recent work with Eliana Duarte, currently at Universidad de Porto, that uh, actually evolves out of a project where we were interested in understanding the algebraic geometric structure of uh, interventional uh, graphical models, uh, and interventional DAG models to be specific. And to answer those, those particular more theoretical questions, it turned out to be helpful to pass to a more refined representation of the DAG model. Uh, something known as its stage tree representation. And um, when exploring things from that perspective, we started to wonder what, what, how can these models, which turn out to be much more diverse in a sense than our classic DAG models, be used uh, to give us uh, more refined uh, but tractable uh, types of interventional models where we can still prove the theorems that we like, uh, but gain some diversity in what we're modeling. So um, those, are, those are the things that I want to tell you a little bit about today. And I'll try and uh, tell you what we've observed so far and, and leave you with some directions for where I, I see the work generalizing. Um, so what's, what's really the problem that we're interested in here? Well, uh, at the basis of the probabilistic theory of causality right now, the starting point is, is conditional independence relations uh, that we observe in our observational distribution. And then we associate, we, repre we represent those with a DAG model, right? Um, but one immediate limitation to this approach is that um, uh, that they, they uh, that working with only these CI relations limits our ability to capture context-specific causal information. So such statements such as what are called asymmetric CI relations or CSI relations, where uh, in addition to our regular old conditioning set, we have some some realization of the fourth set of variables. So the first question we would want to ask ourselves is. Uh, how do we go about representing these more granular sets of relations and the context-specific causal information they encode? Um, and this is not at all a new question, right? So, I mean, this is something that's been investigated from a variety of perspectives over the last 30 years or so, maybe even longer. Um, but uh, in particular, the, the family that we wanted to work with, these, these stage tree models, uh, in some sense, they're very simple to define and uh, represent a high level of diverse context specific information. Uh, so we sort of wanted to explore what we could do from that, that side of things. So our starting point is these stage tree models, um, also called chain event graphs that were introduced by Smith and Anderson in 2008. And as I said, they're very, they're very straightforward to define. A, a stage tree model is really just a colored probability tree over some, sub, uh, over some set of variables, x1 through xn, uh, where we start with some root node, and then the remaining nodes in the tree correspond to realizations of subsets of the variables. And uh, we add some colors to this tree. Uh, for example, here, these, these two nodes are blue. Um, and these, these colors represent that the transition probabilities from these current, these two different states are uh, to their next state are actually equal, okay? So in particular, the probability of going from X3, uh, given that X1, X2 is one, one, is the same as going to X3, given X1, X2 is zero, one, is the blue stage. And uh, to simplify things, when we're representing these models uh, to avoid too many colors, if we make a node white, that just means that it's a color of its own. It has its own set of transition probabilities. So what is our model that we're actually interested in studying here? Well, each of these different stages, each of these different colors now needs some, some transition probability parameters here. And these can be some numbers between zero and one that sum to one. So we map from all such set of possibilities into the probability simplex by multiplying along the root to leaf paths in this tree. So this cuts out a subset of distributions um, that is our stage tree model MT. And we're interested in studying uh, the structure of these models, right? So as I said, these, these stage tree models, while including families of DAGs, uh, can do much more diverse context specific things. Uh, so for instance, uh, if we don't color the tree in this nice symmetric way that I'm coloring it here, but we do something like this instead, we're now encoding things like the, trans the probability of three given x1, x2 is zero, one is the same as the probability of two uh, given x1 is one. 
Um, we can also do things like in different contexts, uh, switch switch the, the, the partial order that imposed on our variables, right? So unlike a DAG model, there's no need to restrict to a certain partial order. So in the context x1 is one, maybe the next variable is two, but when x1 is zero, the next variable is three. Um, but uh, it, we can go even further. So for example, doing things like truncating the trees, uh, we can encode uh, missing data or unobserved outcomes in, in certain contexts, but also we can also very easily represent uh, hard intervention. So for example, if you want to do x2 is equal to one, we just truncate the tree there, okay? So um, more recently, these have also been extended to uh, models that allow for stochastic soft interventions. So here, the idea is now that we want to pick maybe in some certain context, a subset of these transition probabilities that we allow to vary between our experiments. Um, and the other ones should remain invariant, right? Uh, so just similar to the, the DAG model setting. So for instance, if we wanted to do two different experiments, then we would take two copies of our tree here, and we would replace these root nodes with our different intervention targets, which can now be context specific. So for instance, maybe in the first experiment, we intervene at, we target three in the context x2 is zero. So that would correspond to targeting these transition probabilities. And all that it means is that since we don't do that target, since, uh, since we're targeting that in this experiment, then when we look up here, we should allow for different parameters in the same stage up here. Um, similarly, in this experiment, we maybe we target two in the context x1 is zero. So now these transition probability parameters should be allowed to vary from these ones. Um, but abiding by the rule of invariances, we should consider all other causal mechanisms in their different contexts invariant between the two trees. So for example, since we don't target x2 in the context x1 is one, then these parameters should be identical to these. So then we can color the tree to, to capture this invariance, right? So now we start to see the issue, right? So we have these very simple to define models that are highly expressive, but I only have three binary variables in two experiments and it takes up the entire wall, right? And it's, it's quite difficult to look at this massive picture and read off immediately causal information in the way that we like to do with causal Bayesian networks. So um, this sort of brings us to the downside of working with these, these models, right? So while they have a high level of expressive capability, this comes at a cost. In particular, uh, they lack easy human interpretability. Like this, this stage tree that I drew that we started with here actually just encodes the CI relation. One is an independent of three given two. So it's much easier just to work with the, the causal path, right? Um, at the same time, this added level of expressiveness means that it's more difficult to prove the theorems that we get so much mileage out of with DAG models. So for instance, uh, it's difficult to come up with global Markov properties or structural characterizations of model equivalents, things that drive our learning algorithms, right? So uh, this is in some sense a major downside because Global Markov properties are nice, right? They allow us to do things like read more complex CSI relations from the representation. Right now, it's, it's really only easy to see uh, the relations implied directly by the coloring. Anything more complicated than that, you have to do some, some mental yoga. Um, but going beyond that, the global Markov properties often are our main tool for proving characterizations of model equivalence or interventional model equivalence. And in turn, these, these drive many of our structure learning algorithms like GES or the PC algorithm or things like this. So where are we at? Well, we've defined a very general family of models. And in the universe of all sort of statistical models, we can maybe think of stage trees as being a super cluster of models and the DAGs as being a galaxy within, right? Um, and the question that we really want to know is what are the things that are bounded to DAGs by gravity? What are the models where we can prove the theorems that we like that generalize what we know about DAGs and start to make use out of them to, to do these sorts of things, right? So, so this is the question we want to know. For which stage trees can we prove the theorems that we like to use? Where can we get these nice global Markov properties that lead to structural characterizations of interventional model equivalents? So um, as I said, I kind of want to view this talk and its results as a starting point for this, this exploration. Um, 
And the, the claim is, is that at least one family that we can identify exists within this, this local group around DAGs. Um, and this is a set of models that we're currently calling these CS trees. So um, to do this, uh, to define this family, we have to restrict this set of stage tree models and essentially start by doing away with some of the fun context specific things you were looking at first, but hopefully we'll see natural roads as we analyze them for, for bringing some of this complexity back into the picture. So the first thing that we need to do is impose that actually we're not allowed to change the partial order or change the total order variables within different contexts. So right now, two comes after four and when one is zero and two comes or three comes after two in the context uh, x1 is one, but we're not going to allow that. We need to abide by some total order of the variables for now. So we have to say maybe one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? We're also not going to allow right now for truncation, right? So we need to assume that all of our root to leaf paths have length n. So there's no sort of unobserved outcomes for now. Um, and these two properties combined already help us sort of simplify this picture a bit. Uh, if we make these two assumptions, then it's very easy to keep track of what the nodes in this tree actually are. Uh, so we have always our root node, but then given this, this total order, the nodes at, level, at distance k from the root node in the tree correspond to the, the realizations of the first k variables in our total order, right? And if we just remember that up is zero and down is one, well, then we can just draw this picture instead, which is a bit easier to work with. So um, now these two properties are maybe not the most critical at first, uh, but then the real sort of critical properties that we're going to work with deal with how we go about coloring this tree, how we put things into these different stages. Um, and the first condition on that is that we're only going to allow nodes that correspond to realizations of the same length, so at the same distance in the tree or in the same level of the tree, to be the same color. So right now, these two yellow nodes, this is a realization of the first two variables, and this is a realization of the first three variables. So we're going to exclude that. We're going to say, we need something like this instead, okay? Um, and then perhaps the most critical property is that uh, for every stage, so now a stage is something that exists in, in level K, so it's a realization of the first K variables, we're going to want that they, they all contain some common subcontext, say XC, that we call this stage defining context of the tree. And the stage itself then has to be defined by allowing all of the other, all of the other variables uh, that correspond to that level to vary to their different possibilities. Okay. So right now this tree satisfies this condition. So this one is genuinely a CS tree. But for example, this orange stage corresponds to all of the realization, all of the realizations of x1, x2, x3, where we have x1 is one and x2 is or x3 is zero. But if, say, we wanted to include this node as well, well, then the only common subcontext would be x1 is 1. So we'd have to include this node as well, right? So we get some sort of swallowing property. So why would I do all of this work? Well, I want something that is similar to DAX, right? And this actually allows our stages uh, to, this actually allows our model to not just be defined by this, this uh, multiplication along these root to leaf paths, but now our stages are actually associated to very specific types of CSI relations, right? There are things that look like this, and now we can think of our model as being generated by these relations, as opposed to just this, this multiplication, right? So now we have in some sense, say, a, a uh, local Markov property or something like this. So given that we can now sort of think of our model as being defined by these relations, then we can do what we do with DAGs, right? We start with, the relations that generate the, the model. And we ask, what are all the CSI relations that, that these imply? So we need to look at the associated context-specific conditional independence model. So those CSI relations that are imply, <coughs> implied by some context-specific conditional independence axioms. So uh, these are just an extension of the classic conditional independence axioms, like symmetry and decomposition and weak union. And for each of these, we just are going to tack on this context and it just carries through to the other side of the statement. 
Um, but then we also need some way of moving between these different uh, contexts. So the natural way to do that is to think about something such as specialization and absorption, right? So in the specialization case, well, we, have, we can condition on this set here, and we have this context here, but if we take some subset of the variables here and specialize them to a certain realization, we've just extended this context, right? Going the other way, if we take some subset of our context, so here, and we can change to any other realization, those variables, uh, those variables outcome, and still get the same looking CSI relation, well, then we can absorb that piece over here and shrink this context, right? So you applying all these rules iteratively, we can generate the entire uh, con context specific conditional independence model, and then ask sort of what are the key generators in this? And can we find some, some underlying generators here based on these choices of context that capture everything that we want, but maybe expose more of the global structure of these CSI relations? So what do we use for that? Well, here we look at what we call these minimal contexts. So these are just contexts in which there exists some CSI relation that is not implied by specialization of anything else. So it's sort of at the bottom of these relations, right? So we collect all of these minimal contexts into a set CT, and then we can start using these to try and represent the model instead. So how do we do that? Well, we now have our minimal contexts that come from the tree, and we have this total order here. So what we can do is just look at all of the uh, CSI relations with that given minimal context and take a minimal I map with respect to this order here. Okay. So for instance, in this tree, one can find that the minimal contexts are actually x1 is 0, x2 is 0, x3 is 0. And then we just take a minimal, a minimal I map of the CSI relations with each of those contexts, and it gives us these three graphs. Now, the idea is that, uh, is that what we would want to see is that in this representation, where we can see more, well, for this very small example, we just see pairwise relations, but for larger examples, we would want to see that this is telling us uh, a larger set of CSI relations, right? So what we want is that uh, any distribution that is in some sense Markov to this sequence here is actually in this model here and vice versa. So what do we say? We define being Markov to this sequence of graphs as just saying that the distribution will entail a CSI relation if and only if uh, in a given context, whenever there's an A, whenever A and B are deseparated given S in the context graph. And this has to be true for all of these context graphs. <coughs> context graphs, sorry. So um, if we do this, then it turns out that we give what we want, right? A distribution will be in this, this model MT if and only if it's Markov to this sequence of context graphs. So this, in some sense, is our global Markov property. It's not complete. We can't read off every CSI relation. Uh, encoded by uh, encoded by the model from these context graphs, but we can certainly read off more of them. So, um, and in fact, we can read off enough of them that we can actually get structural characterizations similar to the Verma Perl type characterization of uh, of model of DAG model equivalence. So, in particular, we see that uh, two stage tree models are actually equal, or CS tree models are actually equal if and only if they have the same set of minimal contexts. And if, uh, if we fix one of these minimal contexts, then their two um, context graphs have to be Markov equivalent, right? So we can reduce it to looking at skeletons and V structures. So for instance, here, we, could, we can actually generate a CS tree that has this as its sequence of context graphs. And we see in the first two contexts, it's just identical. And then the last one, we've reversed an arrow, but we haven't introduced any uh, these structures. So these two models actually represent the, these two CS trees actually represent the same model. Now, this is just the observational story. Um, but what we're really interested in here is what can we say in the case of soft stochastic interventions. So we want to turn back to these these larger interventional trees that we were looking at before, and see if we can do the same sort of thing. 
So now here, remember our, our set of interventions is some collection of subsets of stages in T. So for instance, in this tree, we're, we're intervening at two in the context that X1 is zero and uh, three in the context that, that X1 is zero. So that's these two stages here. And we encode that by having them be different colors between these two trees, right? So our interventional model just says that for each of our intervention uh, targets, we have a different distribution. They're all Markov to this CS tree. And if we don't intervene in, in two different experiments, if we don't intervene at a certain node, then the associated transition probabilities are invariant. Okay. So um, now what would we do? Well, what we would what we'd hope we can do is just do what we would do in the case of DAGs, right? We would just want to take our context graphs, augment them based on the interventional experiments, add some nodes and arrows, and hopefully get out the same sort of result, right? So in this case, uh, we also will just add in this, for bookkeeping purposes, this uh, minimal eye map of the entire tree. Um, but how do we go about doing this augmentation process? Well, for, for each of our non-observational experiments, we're going to add in a node. So here we have one, it's this I2. So we add in the node WI2 here, and we're going to draw an arrow uh, in these context graphs from our interventional node to the targeted node, so long as the node is targeted within this context, right? So for instance, three is targeted in the context X1 is zero, and two is targeted in the context X1 is zero, and nothing is targeted in the context that X1 is one. So we should add these two arrows in that context, and that implies some arrows in the in the empty context, but there's no context, no arrows added in, in the case when x1 is one. Okay. So now one would hope that this is sufficient, right? That we could take, for example, an extension of the, the I Markov property of Yang et al. from 2008 and say that a sequence of distributions is in a sense Markov to this, this set of da this sequence of DAGs if and only if it's in the interventional model for this tree here. Um, but uh, so what that would amount to saying is that we want each of these to satisfy this Markov property with respect to the entire sequence of context graphs. That's all this first condition is saying. And then we would want to satisfy a second condition related to invariances, um, which just says that if I, if I have some with, if I fix a minimal context, and I have two disjoint sets of nodes, A and S, and the set A is D separated from the interventional node given S and the other nodes, then I should see invariance in the distribution of A given S in that context, right? So, so one would hope that this works, um, but we have to be careful. The thing is, is here we sort of picked our interventions very nicely but we could pick them in a, in a stranger way, right? We just pick stages for these interventions. And one option here would be, for example, to also have been intervened at this green stage, right? So if we intervened here, we would allow these transition probabilities to be perturbed in the context X1 is one, which would mean that we should add in an arrow from uh, WI2 to three in that graph. <laughs> but if we then consider that sort of by Markov property with respect to this sequence here, then we would actually be missing an invariance that's a defining property of our, of our model here, right? We wouldn't be able to recover this invariance of these two blue nodes because it's somehow obscured by this arrow. So the quick fix for this is to, to refine our intervention targets. So uh, one, the way to go about doing that to make sure everything works out is to say that a set of intervention targets is complete if whenever there's some node in some stage in the target, such, then it needs to satisfy two conditions. First, we need that there is some minimal context uh, that, that is a subcontext of that node, meaning that the target will actually be recorded in one of these graphs. 
And the second one that helps us avoid this issue that we're seeing here is that if there's some other node with that same subcontext, then it will also be targeted. So that would prevent us from having this sort of blue green paradigm happening. Um, so in that case, we can get out the theorems that we want, right? We can see that this context specific I Markov property is actually our global Markov property for these interventional CS trees. And we can derive a, a structural characterization of model equivalence again. In particular, uh, if we draw these two diagrams for each of our CS trees, we should see the same, uh, we should see the same minimal context with the same skeletons and these structures. Now, um, so this is what we've been able to observe so far, but after having walked through this story, it's sort of clear that there's lots of room for, for generalization. And there's been lots of nice talks so far that focus on uh, their work as sort of a starting point for things to do. And, and I've I really like that idea because it's, it hopefully helps us have some broader discussions while we're here this week. So I just wanted to end with uh, some, a few obvious ways that I, I see us being able to generalize these things. So everything that we've done so far has hinged on this set of, of minimal context, the set CT. And uh, even this example that we just looked at of intervening at this green node and not this blue node suggests that the right way to go about generalizing the story is to extend this set, right? So one way to do that in the interventional case is to introduce some notion of minimal invariance context. So we add some context to it where we actually can record this additional polynomial constraint to this invariance of the blue stage when X1 is one and X3 is one or X2 is one, whatever it was. Uh, in a similar fashion, we can start trying to ask if we can bring in some of these nice context specific properties that we set aside when we were first defining these models. In particular, if we don't want to impose a total order of the variables, but allow the order to vary in context specific settings, we should just take some minimal context that the, in which they abide by some, some total order. Um, and same thing with missing data. We can, we can do a similar restriction there and just extend this family of graphs to, to hopefully generalize this family and find more models where we can prove the theorems that we like to prove. Um, if we don't want to explore those questions, we can already start trying to make use of these results here. So, so far we've implemented some very basic uh, causal discovery algorithms but there's more work to be done. So now that we have structural characterizations of model equivalents, we can ask about, can we give things like a consistent generalization of GES to this family? Or in the case of the stochastic soft interventions um, where GIES fails to be consistent, we can ask about other algorithms such as the interventional greedy SP algorithm, if we can give a consistent generalization thereof. So, um, I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much Dean, for the nice talk. We have a half hour break now. And then after that, uh, uh, Chris Harsha will uh, give the third talk of this session and then we'll have the panel with all the questions then. Coffee is outside. See you again in half an hour. Thank you.